Uh, I'll start off. A quick note before we start. The session is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube with a link to our website. And our website is icss.marks, and that will be up in a few days. Uh, before the pand pandemic, this weekly program was hosted at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library in Oakland. But since the pandemic, we've been on Zoom, and so we have a broader audience. So for those of you who are not in the Pacific time zone, good afternoon, or maybe even good evening. For over a decade and a half, Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library, uh, these programs that we've been presenting have been a platform for diverse presentations on a variety of topics, including political economy, the struggles of the working class, the fight against imperialism and militarism, resisting racial and gender injustice. But you definitely don't have to be a Marxist to join these meetings. Um, in fact, um, uh, we invite everybody to join, join our, our programs. However, we and by we, I mean the Institute for the Critical Study of, um, study of Society, the ICSS, that's what we call ourselves. We're united in our respect for the work of Karl Marx. And we believe this work remains relevant today. Our tagline is, is Marx's um, famous saying from his 11th thesis on Feuerbach, quote, philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Uh, you can sign up for email notifications for future programs, view past programs, and contact us at our website. And again, our website is icssmarks.org. We always welcome input, feedback, suggestions for topics, and speakers. My name is Roger Harris, and I'm a member of the program committee that organizes the Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library. And before I, we start, I'd like to remind everyone that this is a comradely forum for political discourse and debate. And as such, we ask that you show respect for the other participants, the moderator, and of course, the speaker. So please note that the opinions expressed here are those of the speaker and participants. They are not necessarily represent the ICSS or the Marxist Library. Now, so we'll, we'll have a uh, presentation that will run about 45 minutes. We'll have a short break for announcements, and then that will be followed by a Q&A, and we hope to wrap this up by about 12.30 Pacific time. I am really, really um, honored to bring our speaker uh, here. Our uh, speaker is Paul uh, LaRudy, um, and Paul just recently returned from a humanitarian mission to besiege Gaza. And he was, they were denied entry by the, by the Egyptian authorities and had a number of close calls. I believe that, Paul, maybe you got arrested by the Egyptians. At least we all got arrested. Yeah. Um, anyway, our speaker will be talking about the ongoing genocide against the Palestinians and explain why this is a natural outcome of the Zionist ideology. Paul is an Iranian-American. Um, he's a political activist, and he's been a major figure in the pro-Palestine movement. He's based in the San Francisco Bay Area, as, as I am, and he's been to Palestine many times since 1965. And in the chit-chat right before this meeting opened, um, I recently, we, we, we found out that Paul actually spent some time in the Mediterranean Ocean when he jumped the ship um, on a political um, uh, demonstration and had to be fished out of the water. But that's another story. Um, in terms of Paul's activism, he's active in the International Solidarity Movement, that's the IC, uh, ISM, and that's a nonviolent resistance group. And also he's one of the leaders of the Sol Syria Solidarity Movement, the SSM. Paul is the co-founder of the Free Palestine Movement, the FPM, and the Free Gaza Movement, the FGM. And their boats were the ones that broke the 41-year Israeli naval blockade of Gaza in August 2008. He, um, and he was also a member of the U.S. delegation aboard the Gaza Freedom Flotilla. And I believe some of the other um, participants 
in the audience here have been on that too. And that was attacked by Israeli forces on May 31, 2010. Um, besides all that, Paul has a PhD in linguistics, and he spent about 14 years in Arab countries. He worked on supervising a Ford Foundation project in Lebanon. Worked, um, he worked as a Fulbright Hayes lecturer in Lebanon as well, and as a U.S. government advisor to Saudi Arabia. He's also a registered piano technician. Um, amongst many um, reward, awards and recognitions, Paul received the Lifetime Peacemaker Award from the Mount Diablo Peace and Justice Center. And uh, another, albeit inadvertent tribute to Paul's dedication and effectiveness, is that he has been consistently doxxed by Zionist forces. So I with um, great honor to introduce Paul. Um, the um, forum is all yours. Thank you very much, Roger. It's a pleasure to be with everybody. Um, it occurs to me that I should probably add, I might prefer to subtract some of the credentials that you mentioned, but, but I want to add one, and that is that very recently, I was featured in an advertisement on Facebook from which I'm banned, so I never saw it. Um, and uh, that... Uh, advertisement was actually published in Hebrew. And it was, the first sentence was, uh, uh, Paul LaRudy needs to be assassinated. Uh, so I take that with great pride as, uh, as I'm sure many of you would to, 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 to think that somebody considers me that important, but anyway. Let me get on with this. So <clears throat> first of all, I was unable to as uh, to upload uh, uh, some information. One was a map of, of uh, uh, Gaza, which I think many of you already have this map in your head. So maybe that I can manage without that. But also I wanted to uh, add two articles that I published this year that are uh, relevant to the talk. One is called The Genocide is Israel's Strategy, which is the same as the name of this presentation. And it's published, uh, if you want to find it, at Def Defend Democracy Press. And that was on November 11th. So yeah, it's about a month ago. Um, the uh, the second one is called Armageddon and the Le Limits of Evolution, which is a strange title, I, I, I guess, to many years. But it was published by Dissident Voice on uh, July 2nd uh, or 3rd. Uh, I think I may have written it down wrong, um, of this year. So... Um, uh, I'll try to get this uh, posted through Roger on uh, in some way so that you can access uh, it, um, both the map and, and, and the information. Um, but I wanted to start out, I, I, I'm particularly, my, my background is as uh, you could say a scientist. Uh, linguistics became much more scientific, if you like. Uh, with Noam Chomsky and uh, much more theoretical, and I and I follow that train of thought, and I've and I've pursued it for uh, in many things, but in this case, um, the I, I prefer. I want to tell you that I prefer uh, taking things to their to the roots of ultimate principles, much as as Karl Marx did. And uh, to take that, take it to the the roots of of um, explanation and to their nature and so forth. So I, that's what I want to do. And then this this was a lot of these germane uh, principles are found in the article entitled Armageddon and the Limits of Evolution. And one of the general principles, which is possibly 
generalizable to um, to life of all kinds, both on our planet and anywhere. Uh, that's my thesis, anyway. That um, that evolution is a function of the competition between species and within species. Um, and that uh, this competition is essential to life forms. It, it, life forms basically can't exist without competing against each other. Um, I'll just leave it there for now. You can read the article. But, uh, but one of the consequences uh, of that is that competition can, of, as we know, be in the form of conflict. And, uh, and so conflict has existed between all life forms, uh, including uh, within the human race, Homo sapiens. And, uh, and this has consequences uh, not only for the physical evolution, but also for the social, um, I won't call it evolution because I'm not sure we, we're socially evolved, I, but, uh, uh, but it has to do with changes in the dynamics of, uh, of human interaction. And uh, a key, I think, il way to illustrate uh, what it, the, the impact that it has is to look at the indigenous names of many of the original tribal names of tribes in the Americas and in uh, all over the world, actually. Um, and, and if you look at a translation, if you translate the name of the tribe, uh, or at least one of the names of the tribes, because tribes have sometimes have more than one name. But it is frequently, the name means human being or pe the people. And human being is sometimes, I've seen it on, on films, for example, it's been cited that we are the, uh, uh, we are the human beings. But that sounds wonderful because you know the uh, human beings are all over the globe. But it's not necessarily the way that that the tribal um, uh, people view it. They recognize only the tribe as human beings, possibly in some cases. And that's relevant to some of the ways the most conservative and, and radically conservative uh, Jews, for example, the, the, of the Zionist movement. That's the way they, they view themselves. They're the only real human beings and all the rest are second class beings. So that's, that's a, a relevant point, but it is a universal point. There is a tendency among human beings to view themselves as exceptional. They're uh, themselves, their tribe, their their family, and so forth. So, and, and that's important for this interaction. It's at the basis, uh, or it's a, a part of the basis of of what Marx calls uh, class struggle. Um, some of the classes view themselves as more intelligent, as more reasonable, as as better than the other classes, and and that is why you have a class struggle. Um, you, it, of course, it results in um, in some uh, dominating others, domination of one group. I won't say class, uh, but uh, you could say class uh, of another, and that's that's of course the the course of history that gets most commonly told. Uh, so you have, for example, slavery, colonialism, imperialism, racism. It's all exceptionalism. And and what do uh, what is what are the politics of the U.S. at this time? It's been uh, articulated by the leadership 
the um, the the power base of the, the not the base but the the uh, the representatives of the powerful interests. In it. It's called exceptionalism, American exceptionalism, and once again, it has uh, the it's asserted on the world not as international law but rather rules based order, which is determined by. Um, by the leadership of the United States and its cronies in allies and in other countries. And it, it, uh, um, uh, it, this exceptionalism allows the rules-based order, those rules to be changed at will by the people who have decided what the rules are. So th this is typical. I think that's familiar to everybody. So anyway, let's apply it uh, to Israel. And um, in the case of Israel, I want to begin with this, not far back in history, although I, I might refer to uh, early versions of, uh, of Judaism and the Israelites and the tribe and so forth. But, um, but rather, I want to go back to the 19th century. And I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the study, if you will, uh, of uh, race in the 19th century, the classification of races, which sometimes were uh, five or seven or 10 different classifications of races. Um, and uh, in fact, in my field in linguistics, um, the, the, uh, the classification of languages was, uh, a bit odd. Uh, we're Semitic with, uh, uh, we're familiar with Semitic as a, a group of languages, but there were only two other groups at one time. Let, let's say 300 or 400 years ago, it was classified into Semitic, Hamitic, and Japhetic. Where did that come from? The, the sons of Noah, that's where it came from. <laughs> I mean, it, it uh, and, uh, and that that comprised all the nations on earth as as far as they were it was it was racial and uh um the the races were divided into those as well so um so anyway but in the 19th century um we are familiar for example uh, most prominently with uh, the notion of the aryan race which uh, led to um, the, the Nazi uh, party and so forth. Uh, but there were other, there were there was plenty to, of discussion of uh, races and some major books published on it. And, um, <clears throat> and into this uh, discussion of race came the Zionist uh, um, ideology, which is, was first mainly articulated by Theodore Herzl, of course, um uh, but um they they considered the the the, the original zionists <clears throat> were not religious people <clears throat> they were uh atheists basically mostly uh but they bought into the the notion of race and they wanted to have they this is why they actually got along rather well with the nazis because they they um, they felt that the 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 Jews should be separate from other people and they should have their own country and this is this is the basis of Zionism and that their their race if you will uh, should uh, should create uh, its own separate existence so and, and of course the the nazis liked the idea so um uh, there was a zionist office in, in berlin that uh, coordinated such things and uh um so so zionism uh that was the idea now how do you set up a zionist state it's not like you have all the jews gathered in one place no you have to gather the jews and find a place and they found uh, three main sites that they chose, Uganda and uh, Argentina and Palestine. And, and uh, Palestine 
the most an obvious choice. Uh, but the idea, part of the reason for Uganda and Argentina was that they thought, oh, well, these are, uh, all you have are some primitive people in these places and, and it'll be easy to get them out of the way, just like other colonial projects. But they, they carried it over also to uh, Palestine, although they recognized that pa Palestinians were perhaps somewhat more developed. But nevertheless, they would find a way to get rid of them. Uh, <clears throat> and the way that they specified in the uh, Zionist Congress of, 19, of 1895 <clears throat> was to remove them to other countries, to get, to get them out of uh, the area that they wanted and move them to other countries. Uh, and um, it was, I remember the translation of, uh, of Theodore Herzl, he said, we'll spirit them away to other countries and find employment for them there. Okay. I, I don't think that was necessarily the only alternative they were thinking of. Uh, but um, the means, of course, was applied not only to uh, the creation of a Zionist state, but to the creation of many colonial states. And, and the definition of it is settler colonialism. So, um, and genocide is by no means unusual to the 19th century or the 20th century, it, it goes way back. And I, I'm, I'd be very surprised if it didn't permeate a lot of prehistory as well. So uh, you have it in the ancient history. There are genocides that are reported in the Bible. If I don't know how accurate they are, but they're reported there. The Punic Wars, um, uh, Rome, um committed genocide on, on Carthage and uh the Huns that came into Europe were famous for wiping out whatever uh cities and towns that they had they I, they get probably get some bad press uh, as uh, as did the Mongols um but but there's I, I'd be surprised if there isn't some truth to that and at the same time, uh, <clears throat> um, genocides by so-called what historically have been considered more civilized peoples as well. I think they they could have been, probably committed them just as much. Certainly, in the case of uh, the Western Hemisphere, uh, genocide that's probably the biggest genocide in the history of mankind. Um, to wipe out a major portion of the indigenous population of North, uh, Central, and uh, South America. And of course, the, the same in uh, Australia and in parts of Africa and, and so on. I mean, I, I, you know as well as I do uh, uh, the, the many genocides that have been held and the pogroms, that's part of it. So, <laughs> Uh, in the case of um, Zionism, the uh, the the beginning of it was Plan uh, Aleph Beit Gim and da uh, Dalet, the three uh, letters of the. I hope I got the pronunciation right for the for the um, Hebrew alphabet. Uh, Dalit was the one that was finally implemented. The 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 previous versions of it, uh, I, I don't even know if traces of it survive. But Plan D was the one that was impl implemented in 1947, 48, and 49, for the most part. Although you could say that Plan D is still being implemented. Uh, um, and that was a plan for genocide and ethnic cleansing. Uh, they went to uh, a variety of uh, towns and villages in the territories that were high priority for them to capture. And they, um, <clears throat> and they usually uh, lined up um, 
the young and old uh, older men in the village and just shot them all uh, dead and uh, and told the, the rest of the inhabitants to get out, to leave immediately, or the same would happen to them. This was, a, a, and they relied also upon um, these incidents being reported to other Palestinian community, communities so that those communities would also uh, take flight and leave the land to them. And it worked to a great degree because more than half of the Palestinian population uh, in, fled. And, uh, and it's uncertain, nobody really knows how many were actually killed during that time, but it's could be, could be between 50 and 100,000 people. Uh, but as a one of the newer members of the United Nations who was there, as he said, uh, nobody will know how many children died during that time. So, <clears throat> but it worked. It got, it, it freed the land from the people who were living on it. And uh, it started the problem. Now, um, there, since then, there have been a number of, you can call them massacres or uh, ethnic, ethnic cleansing of sorts. And uh, uh, in, in Palestine, and beyond uh, committed by uh, by Israel. You have, after the Nakba, you have, for example, a famous one is where Ariel Sharon in the village of Qibya in 1953, uh, because they were concerned about Palestinians returning to their lands surreptitiously and, and, and re-inhabiting their villages. And he wanted to make sure that that didn't happen. So in Qibya, he sealed up the uh, uh, inhabitants in their homes. It's a very small village. And then he just, um, he and his, his soldiers uh, shot up the houses with the people in them and uh, set fire to at least some of them. I don't know how, uh, how maybe all of them. I don't know. Anyway, that and the information was passed on, on widely. Um, and it probably was at least partially successful in, in intimidating Palestinians from uh, returning, although Palestinians have never given up returning. Um, and then there was Khan Yunus, uh, which is not told all, all that much, but in 1956, following the <clears throat> uh, the uh, invasion uh, of the Sinai and the, and the Suez Canal crisis, the um, uh, the Israelis went into Khan Yunus in uh, uh, in Gaza, and they lined up um, people that they said later uh, were accused of, of being terrorists. And uh, the qualification for being a terrorist is being, first of all, male, and secondly, above the age of 16. And they lined them up and killed them all. They killed several hundred in, uh, in Khan Yunus. And then later, they killed more than 100 in Rafah, in the south of uh, uh, Gaza. So. That's reported on Palestine Chronicle, if you want to look it up. Uh, recently, it was it was reported. Then in 1967, of course, you know the 67, the Six Day War, which is called the Naksa. <clears throat> More than 300,000 Palestinians were expelled, in, in effect, or driven out. Uh, again, uh, in ethnic cleansing, I don't know if you call it a uh, genocide, but it's at least a partial genocide. In Lebanon, they chased the Palestinians who went into Lebanon, but they also killed Lebanese as well. In Qana in uh, 1996, Sabra and Shatila, um, that was in, I believe, uh, it was 
after I was there. Uh, it was in the early part of uh, this millennium anyway. I can't, I can't remember the date exactly. Uh, and then in 2006, of course, um, there was another invasion of uh, Lebanon, uh, which was ultimately um, uh, unsuccessful. But they managed to expel roughly a million Lebanese for the purpose of seizing the territory south of the Litani River. The Litani River is the largest river, river in the Eastern Mediterranean. <clears throat> and um, they had coveted it. They had included it in the territories that they eventually wanted to get. And this was, at, if not an actual attempt to seize and keep the territory, it was a dress rehearsal for one. Uh, but uh, Hezbollah, of course, was successful in in expelling them from all but a tiny, tiny bit of the uh, Lebanese uh, territory. Um, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> after that, uh, in 2007, you had the sealing of the borders of Gaza when uh, Hamas actually won a plurality of the votes in uh, in the election in that year, and um, and the reaction of uh, Israel was was to uh, cut them off and 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 seal the borders uh, of Gaza, eventually putting up walls and uh, all this and. Uh, uh, preventing fishermen from going out uh, far enough to get any any meaningful fish uh, on the coast, it was it was sealed off at that time. Uh, in two thousand and eight, <clears throat> right after the voyages that uh, eventually made it to Gaza by sea, that was the one that I and and four other colleagues. Uh, organized and put together. We went in two small boats in in August, and um, and actually entered Gaza. In fact, uh, there were four other uh, voyages that same year. But the voyage at the end of the year, <clears throat> in late December, failed, and um, and that. So I, I have to think we were we came at a time when Israel didn't want to telegraph its intentions and so they they said okay what's the big deal let them come in but but since that time <clears throat> um none of no boats have gone in by sea and uh in at the end of that year just as obama was taking office uh the or just before he took office for several weeks they there was an invasion and it was nasty and it was it was genocidal um but it didn't last very long it was a couple of weeks the next one was in 2012 another in 2014 the one in 2014 was the nastiest and i think that was the one where what was it? Thirteen um, uh, Israelis were killed. Almost all of them um, uh, Israeli soldiers. Whereas uh, there were about, I think, it was between twelve and fourteen hundred uh, casualties. The ratio was essentially uh, one to a hundred in terms of casualties. Uh, and most of the casualties uh, are, um, committed by Israel were civilians. Uh, then there was another in 2021. I won't get into the details, but it, finally, and finally, of course, we come to no November 7th of this year, where Hamas, uh, Al-Qassam brigades, Islamic Jihad, the PFLP, and other smaller groups uh, all uh, coordinated to to bring about what what we see this year. I'm not going to rehash that, but um, they had allies too. They had allies in Hezbollah, which um, which has not by any means done everything it's capable of doing. 
uh, but it is it is fighting the battle on the northern frontier. And uh, Hashta Shabi, uh, the um, popular uh, units in in uh, uh, in um, Iraq, have uh, have also participated. Uh, Yemen, uh, Iran has not participated directly, but they had a lot. They've had a lot of cooperation with. Uh, uh, the resistance in uh, in Gaza in terms of weapons design, and they may have smuggled in a few things, but there's a very interesting, um, uh, very interesting uh, uh, report of how uh, Hamas put together the weapons that it had. It got some materials from a sunken World War II ship outside uh, that's in the waters of, of Gaza. It got, it used a uh, uh, pipeline that were laid there as the bodies of some of the rockets that it used. Yeah, it's, it's very, very interesting. They were extremely resourceful, let's say, with what could be found uh, in Gaza, basically. Um, and they, of course, had this enormous tunnel system, which could be between 200 and 300 uh, kilometers beneath the ground, as much as uh, 70 meters below the ground. They, they went very deep, um, where even the, the strongest uh, bunker buster bombs uh, can't reach them. So th that's part of uh, their, their it's been their strategy. Now, um, the Israeli strategy, uh, th but to say, I mean, it's clear that Israel, for all its efforts, has been essentially unable to wipe out, or even as far as as many of us can see, uh, to have very much effect upon the capabilities of Hamas and its allies. Uh, and, and because of that, or at least partly because of that, uh, it seems that uh, Israel, uh, Israel's only strategy, as I said in my article, is genocide. That they want to make um, the damage so painful that they will somehow get Hamas to give in or to make them irrelevant or something. I'm not. I'm not sure. But in any case, their only image of winning the war is destroying, killing, starving, uh, and. Uh, and ultimately, I th their preference might be to expel the existing civilian population of Gaza. Now, uh, that, um, but I don't think they're making much impact on Hamas. And I don't think Hamas is, uh, it's, I, I don't think Hamas finds this unexpected. I, I think they anticipated this and I think they prepared for it. But here's the Hamas strategy. The Hamas strategy is that in every conflict that, uh, that Israel has had, it has relied upon massive uh, military strength applied for a short period of time because otherwise they have to mobilize their, their entire population uh, for military purposes and the economy falls apart. Now the United States is, is uh, making up for this by giving them emergency aid of $14 billion at one time to sustain the economy mainly, but also for the purpose of uh, weapons purchase. This is on top of the 3.8 billion that they provide each year. 
uh, and uh, and so this this is how um, uh, this is how they're able to maintain it. But that, but they it's very painful. Already, a, a more than a quarter million uh, Israelis have, have left since October seven. They've left the country, and they've had to evacuate the the northern parts of the country where Hezbollah can reach them, and and also the southern parts of the country where they are within the reach of uh, of Hamas missiles and and uh, drones and so forth. Uh, so it's it's very it's rather painful for for Israel as well, even though they managed to keep um, the economy going. Uh, and then there, of course, there are the hostages or cap captured uh, persons, uh, including uh, prisoners of war. Essentially, uh, although this is not strictly speaking a war, it's a, it's a um, it's not between two nations, for example. So uh, anyway, that's that's what's going on. And what um, I think that Israel is totally prepared to to annihilate the Palestinian people of Gaza if they if they don't move. Uh, to other countries, and they're trying to get other countries to uh, to take them, but um, but the alternative is to is to com completely wipe them out. Now they're not going to do that at the current rate that they're killing them with their uh, bombs and other weaponry. The um, the e even at the massive killing that they're doing now, it would take a long time to kill uh, 2.2 or 2.3 uh, million uh, Palestinians in Gaza. No, what they're doing is driving the Palestinians from the north of Gaza to the south. They've almost completely uh, removed the Palestinian population from the north of Gaza. They've done the same for central Gaza, Deir el In the north, the major city is uh, Gaza City. In the center, it's Deir el -Bara. And if you go farther south, you come to Khan Yunus. And what they're doing in Khan Yunus is to drive the population uh, down to Rafah. Rafah is a city right on the border with Egypt, down in the very bottom uh southernmost portion of Gaza, which is, you know, what, 24 miles long, three to seven miles wide. Uh, and um, it was already considered by many to be uh, the, uh, the most uh, populous region of the entire world, or Earth. So, <clears throat> uh, but now, this all of these people are squeezed into a, a rather small city, Rafa. Uh, most of them are there, there, and uh, and at the same time, uh, Israel is cutting off everything that can be supplied from outside, with the exception of a trickle of supplies coming through the Rafa crossing from Egypt, and going through Egypt and then being um, held up by Israel. And eventually Israel will allow some or all of it into, into Gaza. But that's, that's a drop in the bucket in terms of medical supplies, in terms of um, fuel to power, to heat homes, to power uh, vehicles, uh, ambulances, to, to carry things from one place to another, uh, to power the generators of the hospitals, which in any case have been blown to smithereens in, in, in many cases by the uh, Israelis. Um, they're not getting medical uh, supplies. Uh, they don't have water. They don't have clean water, most of them. The dysentery is on the rise. The idea is 
very much like the uh, the Warsaw Ghetto, where you just cut off everything and let starvation and pestilence uh, take care of killing the population much faster than you can with with weaponry. It seems to me that that's essentially what Israel is trying to do, and it rings. It, it, we don't we don't hear it, of course, in the media. But I, I uh, but we will when it's too late. We will hear about it when it's too late, and it'll of course all it'll all be blamed on Hamas and and uh, the resistance against um, uh, uh, against Elvis. The answer I am ultimately for this problem of. Uh, I, uh, my opinion, the only the only realistic answer. It's not realistic under the present circumstances, but if you ever ever want a real solution, it's it's the South African solution. It is one person, one vote, equal rights to everybody within the entire region, not two states. Two state in order to have two states, you've got to have one one state that is absolutely a racist state that demands that the population look like whatever you want to call it, uh, Jews, Zionists, uh, whatever. That's what they want. They may have different races. You've got black, white, so, but they, but it's for Jews and it's got to be maintained. So if the number of non-Jews gets to be too, too great, it has to be uh, removed. So that's uh, that, that has to end. It has, it's the only real solution to the problem that uh, uh, that Palestinians and what are now called Israelis live together in one state with equal rights. That's, uh, I can't see it happening, but I think the results of what's going to, uh, of what's going on right now is going to be rather interesting. I think uh, the, the, the reason that Hamas uh, started this was to break the deadlock. And I think they they're on a, a course to achieving that. So I'll end, end it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. And um, we'll have a Q and A just just a moment. Um, we don't have a speaker yet for next week, so we'll be announcing that, and then we'll have um, two weeks off for the holidays. Um, so now we'll begin the the Q and A, and to um, Get in the queue, go to the bottom of your screen. There's a little bo bo um, logo that has a happy face and a plus that says reactions. Hit that, put up your hands, and I'll try to call people in the order that I, I see them on, on, the screen, on the screen. And I emphasize that um, with the uh, Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library, all opinions that are expressed here are those of the speakers and of the participants. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of either the ICSS, the Institute for the Critical Study of Society, or the Marxist Library for that matter. So um, I think I think I saw Kit's hand first, but um, I think uh, I'll ask Kit to start. Um, we'll, we'll ask the, the uh, people that are called to make a, either a comment or a question or a combination of both um, and, and, and limit it to about two minutes. And then we'll give Paul a chance to respond. So Kit, you um, unmute un yourself. You might want to also put on your, your video so we can see you. And um, why, why don't you start, Kit? Hi, Kit. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Paul, I really appreciate your uh, historical uh, review of what's been happening down there historically. Um, uh, this is a lot of information. I have certainly not read all these uh, historical accounts, but I intend to do that now that I have a, an outline of what's happened. It's, it's horrendous. It, it just makes me sick to my stomach what, what has occurred there. And I don't need much convincing to know who the true enemy is and why we really have to call for a ceasefire here. Um, and the solution is definitely going to be a complicated one. Um, I think it's yeah, it was hard for me to write down the cities here. Um, I, I got Gaza City. I got 
Han Yunis, but what was the city in central uh, uh, Gaza that oh, you... Oh, Deir el-Balaf. Can you spell that, please? Uh, D-E-I-R, -E <clears throat> new word, A-L hyphen, B-A-L-A-H. Okay. And then... Um, well, do you have an idea of how many countries are actually in support of Israel? I, I assume it's a very small number, but do you know that? I know it's the U.S., of course. I suspect, well, first of all, the uh, EU, uh, I think, without any exception, supports uh, Israel. Um, uh, Ireland is kind of uh, on the fence if you will, they're very critical, but they have, but they are going along with the EU strategy, mm -hmm. uh, policy, I should say. Um, beyond that, uh, there's not a lot of support for, for, for Israel. Perhaps those who are under a lot of, let's say in the domination and dominated by the West, perhaps in Latin America or in uh, uh, West Asia, even the even some of the Arab countries, like uh, uh, you could say perhaps, uh, if, or at least neutral. Um, but there are, uh, Australia certainly is, is with uh, Israel. But <clears throat> it's estimated that 80% of the world's population is not with Israel. Which is interesting, but it's because, of course, the West the, still dominates uh, the world to a significant extent. Although I, I actually think that the West is is that this is the watershed year, twenty twenty three, when in the future we will say that this this constituted the dividing line between 500 years of domination uh, world domination by the west and and uh, let's say a multipolar world uh, so <clears throat> but in terms of population it's estimated that roughly 80% uh, are are with the palestinians but the news is so different in other parts of the world the news in, in, in the West is totally dominated by, uh, by media, which, I mean, uh, is, is very friendly to the Zionist narrative. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Thank so, you. In terms oh, of... I, sorry, one more thing. <clears throat> on the, uh, what I wanted to post online, let me give a recommendation. Uh, I check my Telegram channels every morning and sometimes all day long as well, uh, because you get information uh, through Telegram channels that you can't get it anywhere else. And if you if you sign up to Telegram on your smartphone, then I can give you a list. So I can run down the list right now. I'll hopefully be able to post it. Uh, soon, uh, the of channels that I I go to that to to find uh, information. Would you like me to read them now? Uh, yes, or you can post that on the chat. Oh yes, I let me do that. Okay. Okay. Th thank you. Um, thank you. So, in terms of the stack, this is what I have. It might not be the exact order. I, it's hard for me to keep that um, in track. But uh, next up will be Jan will be Joseph, followed by Janet Cobrin, followed by Jean Rule, followed by Marilyn Langlois, and then Elazar Friedman. So jo Joseph, it's all yours. Yes. Good morning. Uh, first, let me know when I have about thirty seconds left. Next, I'd like to say hi to Paul. Always good to see you. Uh, next, I'd like to say, uh, you know, sometimes I write down thoughts from a Black American perspective um, in, in case I'm ever asked to, to speak somewhere. And first of all, I'd like to say, from that perspective, all Palestinians are innocent when they are defending their indigenous land and people. Um, some of the thoughts that I've written down, I'd like to say here from, from that perspective, 
is that the morally acceptable answer to a violent slave revolt is not accepting more or more brutal slavery. The morally acceptable answer to a violent slave revolt is not accepting more slave whippings, not accepting more slave hangings, not accepting more punitive slave family separations. The morally acceptable answer to a violent slave revolt is not to condemn the violent slave revolt, but to in instead condemn slavery itself. The morally acceptable answer to a violent anti-colonial uprising against a violent colonial state is not to accept an even more violent colonial state, not to condemn the violent and not to condemn the violent, I'm sorry, <laughs> or, or I'm sorry, excuse me, losing track in my notes, not to condemn the violent colonial uprising, but to condemn racist, racist, violently oppressive and dispossessive colonialism itself. The morally acceptable response to putatively or reputedly innocents being killed by a violent slave uprising against a violently oppressive slave society is that that's why there should be no slavery because innocent people on both sides will be killed. And how do you think the slaves in a violent slave uprising, or for that matter, Jews in a violent Warsaw ghetto uprising that hypothetically broke out of the ghetto would feel if they saw white people or German Gentiles partying it up at a hoot nanny or oompa music festival with happy laughing dancing people from the brutal oppressive society down the road. Thank you. Yeah, I, <clears throat> that's a good point. And it, it reminds me that um, that it also brings up the question of a ceasefire. The, sea, the, um, the call for a ceasefire is shared by um, by some Palestinians and many, many uh, Western interest groups, solidarity groups, whatever you want to call them. But I'm not so sure that um, a ceasefire is what a lot of a lot of Palestinians, I don't know how many, but a lot of Palestinians I think are maybe ha have mixed feelings. <laughs> about a ceasefire uh, because including Hamas uh, because because a ceasefire might mean uh, strategically a step back and a step on the road to the return of the status quo ante, which is totally unacceptable and it's the reason why uh, the uh, the October 7th uh, attack by the resistance took place in the first place because they didn't want to, to live like that. So um, so I have some mixed feelings about the, uh, if you're talking about a ceasefire, which uh, allows for Palestinians to assert their sovereignty in, at the, uh, with the same degree that Israel asserts its sovereignty so that it is free uh, to uh, economically free and politically free. Uh, hey, I don't think you'd get an objection from any Pal Palestinian, but if it means <clears throat> going back and somehow getting rid of, of Hamas, which is unlikely, uh, and uh, putting the people in Gaza under the control of, of Mahmoud Abbas and, and his uh, uh, Pal so-called Palestinian authority, which doesn't have any authority, uh, then uh, no, I don't think, I, I think most Palestinians in, in Gaza would, would, would prefer to resist even at the terrible price that they're paying. I could be wrong, but I think there is a significant number of them that would. Okay, thank you. Uh, Janet, you, you're up. Yeah, Janet, you're good. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Hi, Paul. <laughs> I'm really glad that uh, ICSS invited you to speak. Um, 
I have two questions. Um, in my opinion, the UN is feckless and has failed the Palestinian people. Um, but there have been mumblings of a two-state solution by numerous countries in the Security Council. Um, I would imagine anything the UN would agree to would be to make the observer state of Palestine a permanent UN member, and that uh, that would mean Palestine would be led by the PA, uh, Palestine Authority, um, uh, or a refurbished PA, as some of them have referred to. Uh, I think uh, the US might even agree to a two-state solution as long as that Palestinian state would not be sovereign, um, and any, which basically would be pretty much the same as it has been. Uh, regardless, um, I also imagine that Hamas would not support this. Um, and so I'd like you to respond to that. Um, also, you know, we've heard um, Zionist officials calling Palestinians animals. Um, to me, what sad to say, what Israel is doing to the Palestinian <laughs> reminds, reminds me more of how extreme measures are taken by some humans to exterminate insects with chemicals and other measures. Um, I mean, just so drastic, such drastic measures um, the is, Israel is taking. That said, do you think there is something unique about the Palestinian people in their persistence to hold on and return to their land? Something referred to as their steadfastness, steadfastness or sumud. Um, compared to other peoples who have faced displacement and genocide over history? Uh, I don't think it's, uh, I'll take the second one first. I don't think it's um, um, unique because I think a lot of the uh, indigenous American nations had some of the same attachment <clears throat> to their to their land and their 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 um, freedom, uh, and you find the same uh, even among uh, African slaves in the in the United States and elsewhere, which were willing to sacrifice everything in order to uh, to gain their their freedom. I like to think that any of us might might do the same, given such extreme oppression. And uh, so, so I mean, it's, uh, I think it's admirable uh, that the Palestinians do this, but I, I honestly, I'm not terribly surprised. I think, I think it's a, a normal human reaction. And at a certain point, you have nothing less left to lose, nothing left to lose, so why not? Uh, as far as the two-state solution is concerned, I think Israel loves this two-state solution. Why? They have been backing a two-state solution for what, 40 years, 50 years? They love it because it never comes to fruition. And they so so they will they will go along with this two-state solution um, because they will haggle over what the two station two-state solution looks like forever until they finally have the opportunity to complete the ethnic cleansing of all of Palestine. So this is, they love it. As far as Hamas and the rest of them, no, they, they're not going to accept a, a two-state solution. Uh, I, and uh, uh, so uh, I think most Palestinians don't want a two-state solution because they don't believe it'll work. And then I think they're right, it won't. So I think it's a waste of time, which is exactly why it's being proposed. Okay, thank you. And Jean, you're up, uh, unmute yourself, please. And 
Um, all the all speakers have a chance to all commenters have two minutes and it's your your two minutes of fame is up is coming up now, Gene. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you. And thank you, Paul, uh, for appearing with us and for all the work you're doing uh, there. I really, really appreciate that. I, I'm, it's difficult for me to follow what's going on. I can't watch the news when it just, just talks about the horrors coming out of children being killed and so forth. That, that's just horrible. But um, just let me say that uh, I, I'm a, a member of Veterans for Peace um which is uh, uh and we had our chapter meeting uh on yesterday as a matter of fact in which we talked about the um gaza situation and we passed the resolution let me just read that real quickly as an educational and humanitarian organization dedicated to the abolishment of war veterans for peace affirms our responsibility to serve the cause of world peace and global justice by restraining our government from intervening overtly and covertly in the affairs of other nations and by seeking justice for the veterans and victims of war. According, we call for one, an immediate ceasefire and justice for Palestinians. Uh, and that's, I think, a little more than just ceasefire. Secondly, an end to US military financial and diplomatic support for Israel. And I think uh, given the amount of uh, financial, military aid, the fact that there are U.S. warships off the coast of Gaza, and I think there's even 2,000 U.S. Marines that are being trained to intervene uh, boots on the ground as uh, if necessary. So uh, this is pretty dramatic kind of uh, aid and diplomatic aid that the United States has vetoed the Security Council resolution. So I'd just like uh, to say this and uh, any comments you might have on this, I would appreciate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gene. Uh, the, uh, uh, um, maybe you know that I, one of the other people, in fact, I flew over to uh, to uh, Cairo uh, with him was Jerry Condon, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I really admire what Vets for Peace is, is doing, and uh, and he and I had some great talks, as, as you might imagine. Uh, but I, I, I think uh, this is all the pressure that we can we can uh, bring to bear. Uh, from organizations like yours and, and all other organizations, and as individuals, we can just call our, our member, harass is the word, harass our member of Congress and uh, 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 the, the government. I mean, the, the, the government does give in when, when there's enough harassment, um, including uh, torches and pitchforks even, but... Uh, um, but that, uh, uh, but it, it it all it all helps, and and the more we can do, and the sooner we can do it, uh, the better, because because nobody's going to notice the uh, the famine and the disease that's going to happen. That's not they're not going to notice that happening until it's too late. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and Jerry's one of our. Uh, good friends of the East Bay chapter. Thank you, B, for being. I think Gary's on now. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. I think um, it's Marilyn's turn, and and um, that's a nice apron. Is that a, a politically political statement or, or just a practical? Uh, just <laughs> but um, yeah, thank you so much, Paul. I so appreciate your work over the years. I've learned a lot from you. I've been inspired by you. I appreciate both you and Janet Cobran, who's on this call for being part of the Free Gaza Flotilla and actually going on boats to Gaza and all the risks that that involved. Anyway, um, I, I also agree that the UN has been pretty powerless and um, and everything about the two-state solution is just not realistic. You know, given the little islands you have of where Palestinians are allowed to live, even in the West Bank. 
Um, but I've noticed that uh, there was another resolution at the Security Council, and it was 13 in favor. Even U.S. allies, you know, like France and Albania <laughs> voted for it. Uh, UK abstained and US was the only no vote. So it's getting increasingly isolated. I also noticed over, you know, over the last 25 years, I, and it didn't, you, you didn't used to even get in the mainstream press voices in support of the Palestinians. You're now getting voices in support of the Palestinians are actually being printed in newspapers, even if the doesn't really affect the policies and US leaders are calling on Israel to tone it down, although they keep, you know, handing over the weapons. And so what, what I'm wondering is if something that might, and, and in terms of, in, in, in addition to just this, you know, ex exceptionalism and, and desire for megalomania, something that's preventing the U.S. from actually doing the right thing um, has anything to do with what I recently heard Whitney Webb talking about. In fact, she said it a few times. And that is that Israel and Israeli companies control the software of most, if not all, of the United States critical infrastructure. So if if Israel got upset with any action the U.S. took, maybe it could turn off the, the water treatment, turn off electricity, turn off wastewater, turn off the Internet. Do you have you heard? About that and and of course I wish the U.S. would call their bluff and stand up to it. But do, do you have any insight about that? Well, again, I'm going to comment in reverse order. But thank you. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. That's really important. Um, so first of all, as far as this uh, control of um, financial, electronic, all sorts of uh, mechanisms in uh, uh, the functioning of a government and a society and an economy. Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> part of Israel's uh, plan, which it arti has articu articulated many times through what's kind called the Ministry of Hasbara. I've forgotten the exact name of it. Um, but in any case, it's, it's, uh, its purpose is the influence in uh, mainly outside Israel, it, how to influence uh, its outside Israel. And it has, um, by some reports, uh, thousands of, let's say, I guess you could call them operatives, uh, people who are willing to volunteer their services, not always volunteer, maybe sometimes professional, uh, to, to, help Israel with its uh, objectives. And those include the ones that uh, that Whitney, uh, brilliant as usual, uh, has, uh, has articulated and described. And yeah, it's a big, it, uh, control of social media is very important. I'm, I personally, and I'm sure others of you here, <laughs> Sorry, <clears throat> are banned on uh, on uh, a lot of social media, and I, our organization has been booted out by I think four banks thus far. We're uh, in our fifth bank, treading lightly, uh, so that our accounts can can uh, remain there, and. Um, and I've lost uh, PayPal and Stripe and Square uh, and just every single platform until we found one, which if you want to know what it is if for your own purposes, uh, for, for payment platform, they're wonderful. They're absolutely wonderful. They understand our plight and they're sympathetic to it. And they do offer a plat payment platform. Uh, uh, so anyway, there are, you know, we're constantly trying to find ways around around these things. As far as the mainstream media is concerned, <clears throat> um, I interpret <clears throat> their inclusion of sometimes the Palestinian point of view as mainly what they think is safe to include and for the sake of their own credibility. Because <laughs> if they don't include anything, 
people will get it from other sources and they will they will ignore the mainstream media entirely but if they if the mainstream media includes a certain measure of of uh of the least uh, let's say uh offensive from their point of view uh, uh news then then at least they'll appear to be somewhat uh broad in their scope <laughs> and and uh, finally, the United Nations, as far as the United Nations is, is concerned, I think it's functioning exactly as intended. And um, the it could hardly have, have done anything else. I don't think the, uh, the, the United States is bothered at all by being uh, isolated. It has been isolated uh and it feels perfectly big enough um in its uh <clears throat> in its reach that the other nations are super superfluous anyway so i uh i I'm, I'm not expecting anything from the united nations the united nations merely validates uh decisions um mostly by uh, as long as they they're okayed by the United States, if, and once they're okayed by the yeah. United States, then it'll be validated. Except sometimes it'll it'll be vetoed by um, by Russia or China, which is a good thing. That, that's the one good thing there. Okay, um, the stack now is Elazar, Laura <clears throat> Wells, Sharon Rose, Wendy Snyder, and then Joseph is coming back. So. Laura, it's all yours. I thought it was Elazar. Oh, excuse me, Elazar. I'm sorry. I was looking at Yes, the thank you. Uh, you uh, so evidently you can hear me. I can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I want to bring up a couple issues that haven't been touched on that are very important to me. Uh, but I want to just state up front, I don't necessarily accord with a biological evolutionary approach to uh, imperialist politics or to Joseph's uh, slave uh, revolt model, though I definitely would support it uh, in the actions of the American slaves and John Brown. But let me go into it. Saying, receiving the Nakba, really leading to the Nakba of 1948, was an action at the Haifa refineries in Israel in 1947. The Haifa refineries and the railroad workers had Jewish and Arab workers, Arab Palestinians, both. I think the the railroads were like 60, 40, could be worse, and about the same at the Haifa refineries. The, the Communist Party of Palestine organized these and formed armed defense groups of Hebrew-speaking and Arab-speaking never called on the Haganah, never called on the British. They handled it with their own. In 1947, Arabs were at the plant gates simply seeking for employment. The Irgun, the revisionist fascistic movement, shot and killed these innocent workers. This led to Arabs storming into the plant and killing 34 Jews. And uh, I understand on the railroads that the Arab workers did a better job defending their Jewish comrades. This, however, led to a split in the Arab Jewish workers movement, and affected both by the Hista Drut on one side and Arab nationalism on the other side. And that, in a sense, was a prelude to the Nakba. The next point I want to bring out is just a couple of years ago, if not a year ago, there were mass demonstrations in Israel carrying signs saying, free Gaza, no annexations. Netanyahu, crime minister. These were hundreds of thousands of people. I can send photos to whoever and then they could transmit it to the, group, the list. So my view, the reason I don't support Hamas is not a moralistic reason because they their terror is one infinite thousandth or millionth of what the mass terror of the Israeli state has done. It's that it's an ineffective method. 
the in Russia there was a a, 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 a terrorist movement the Narodnovolya, the Bolsheviks preached against it, but if they were arrested, they supported them in defense groups. We should do the same for Hamas people arrested in Israel. But that method of opposing mass state terror with individual terrorism doesn't work. So what's necessary is the program of the Communist Party of Palestine was a multi-ethnic society, a Arab Jewish worker state and a socialist federation of the Near East. Now, that seems very fanciful given the horrible genocidal attacks. But in Israel, there's opposition. For example, recently, the extreme ultra Orthodox Meshorim were carrying Palestinian flags throughout their neighborhoods during this attack on Gaza. The Israeli police smashed some of them right to the ground, Orthodox Jews, and there's videos of it. So what I'm interested in doing is the only solution is to win a large section of the Israeli masses to the side of the Palestinian cause against their own exploiters. That is the method. It seems fanciful. The same thing in the Arab movement. The leadership, which is often nationalist, is also betrays their own base. So what we need to do is a revolutionary approach to this. I'd like to hear Paul's comments. Uh, he comes from a different model than I do. I am very interested in evolutionary theory. My field was molecular biology and biochem and evo devo, evolutionary developmental biology. I don't think it should be mechanically applied to this issue. I'm wondering if Joseph is Joseph Anderson. That's all. Bye-bye. Okay, Paul. And you have to uh, unmute yourself. Mute me. Paul, could you unmute yourself? Uh, mute me. Sorry. Uh, um, uh, yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Elazar. I didn't, uh, for the education about uh, um, what happened in 1947, I guess it, it must have been, uh, in Haifa. That's, that's very interesting. And, um, I don't disagree with, uh, your solution. I just don't see a path to getting there. That's, that, that's the main, uh, obstacle. Uh, as far as, um, you know, uh, Hamas terrorism, um, I, uh, there has been, they have employed terrorism in the past. I don't think that terrorism was a very ele a big element or even, uh, not necessarily an element at all in, uh, the most, in, in, in the October 7th, um, operation. The, the, the problem here is, uh, what information do we trust? And I have seen there there have been reports, for example, and not not reports that have been, <laughs> there have been videos of um, uh, Israeli uh, an Israeli pilot and the uh, uh, and a separate video by uh, or, or was it a video or, or maybe maybe it was just uh, a quote from a tank uh, operator, a commander, that they went in, and I just looked at one today, in fact, on, on uh, um, uh, can I, I can't even find it for you, but it was uh, that, uh, that the, um, the Israeli helicopter gunship that went into the kibbutz uh, had instructions to kill everybody he saw. And it didn't matter whether they were Israeli or not. Uh, and he followed those orders because that was the only way he could be sure that he got any and all uh, non-Israelis, the, 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 the uh, Hamas combatants, although they weren't necessarily all from Hamas, uh, that was the only way to get, to make sure to get them all. 
And this was, this is uh, the so-called Hannibal Directive, which has been around for several decades, uh, uh, but wasn't, uh, as far as I know, applied quite so generally as, it, uh, as during uh, this um, fighting. So uh, that's just an example. And then, the, then you have the question of the, the rapes and so forth, which was uh, determined by the Physicians for Human Rights Israeli chapter. Do, do I think the, the human rights, uh, uh, Physicians for Human Rights uh, uh, the Palestinian chapter would have come up with the same conclusion? I don't know, but since then, there has been no actual evidence that uh, shown uh, the Physicians for Human Rights is the Israeli chapter claimed that they heard directly from the uh, the victims of rape, and now the victims of rape are not quite so vocal. Uh, they uh, they've retracted. Some of them have retracted what they said. So I I, I, I don't trust the the information that we think we have. Um, I'm, I don't always, I, I have my doubts also because, uh, because I know a little bit about Hamas, how Hamas uh, disciplines its people and they're, they're very disciplined. Uh, so I, I, have, I have serious doubts about, about their, their, uh, tactics of what they're their putative tactics good good that's good information paul um so the staff right now and our, our convention as, as people who have been to these meetings before know um we uh call people we try to call them in the order that they raise their hands however if someone's already spoken then if someone raises their hand who hasn't spoken then they go um, get president after that. So the stack right now is Laura, Sharon, Wendy, Jim, and then Joseph, and then Bill. Um, Bill then gets um, on the stack as well. Bill, Bill Mayer. So um, Laura, you're looking green today. Good to see you. <laughs> okay, uh, my question is has to do with the. I'm, okay, has to do with the positions of politicians. Who has any kind of a good position? And the answer might be nobody. And so then my question might be, who's actually the best? And the the groups are, who's best on the situation uh, in Washington? And then the other question is, of the presidential candidates, who's uh, anywhere near decent and or thoroughly decent and other and otherwise I know that there have been resolutions passed at local resolutions by city councils and things like that that are in support of Palestine so that's my question um I I wish I had uh something more optimistic to report, but I mean, you know, as I do, uh, as well as I do, what the situation that we're in. So, uh, I, if, if we had a candidate who um, could take a, a a a good position on this issue and other issues. I really doubt that that person could get elected. And and if they were elected, I think they would not be allowed to to uh, to have any real control. That it would it would. So I I mean I I, I just I can't think of anybody that is is there anybody in. In Washington, I mean, I the answer might be no, <laughs> but anybody in Washington that's even remotely reasonable, decent, decent position. Okay, Cory Bush is in Washington. I mean, that's that's a a good step down the path, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's see, Sharon, you're you're up next. Um, 
Um, thank you. I have a couple of comments. Is, is your video working or do you want to? I, I'm keeping it off. I'm still okay. sick, so. Oh, I'm sorry. I'd rather not. Um, um, first of all, on the history of Zionism, which you and the Zionist ideology, which you uh, referred to at the beginning of your talk, Paul, I absolutely I agree. Um, I was on a panel here last week where I was um, trying to. My main point was that Zionism is a product of European anti-Semitism. Yeah, and nice. a friend criticized me later and said I didn't describe that enough. So I think there was a material basis for third, Theodore Herzl being able to organize the movement that he, you know, that he started. And that material basis was the anti-Semitic um, attacks on Jewish people for centuries um, in Europe. I don't think many Americans know right now the origin of the term beyond the pale. So it's just used as an idiom, right? Generally, oh, too far out beyond the pale. But what the origin is that the czar of Russia decided that Jews could only live in a certain place and it was called the pale of settlement. And they could not own land and that's why they got the reputation of being money lenders because they were, they they had careers in finance. Sharon, what happened? Hello, anybody? Okay, what's up? I don't know what's, uh, Sharon just got cut off. I don't know what's going on. Okay, um, then I guess, we, um, Wendy, if you could take up, take up, go on, or, or did, sure. you, did you, did, or, or Paul, did you, um, Sharon did talk about Beyond the Pale and stuff like that. Did right. you, you want to comment on that, or, or, or should we go on to Wendy? Uh, don't um, I, I'm back. I'm back. I'm sorry. Okay. Something happened on my computer. Um, anyway, um, in addition, I wanted to mention that um, the Israeli fascists are cracking down on the pro-Palestine forces within Israel, of which it's a small number, as we all know, but they do exist. And um, I just heard this morning that they have... Um, Pre prevented Hadash from having its a convention, a meeting, an uh, Israel-wide Israel meeting. Hadash stands for Popular Front for Peace, I believe, and it's supported by the Israeli Communist Party as well, or Communist Party of Israel, CPI. And so they are you know, implementing their um, crackdown on everyone who is expressing um, a demand for the end of the war and for um, uh, and for peace. And then finally, I just want to say that our job, we've come a long way. The, I'm very proud of the young people who have been organizing uh, with the Arab students and the Arab, uh, other Arab organizations around the country and the Jewish Voice for Peace and Not In Our Name, that they're doing a really good job but we, the Zionists here are still uh, dominate us. So even our wonderful um, progressive representative Barbara Lee, she could not bring herself to vote no on the resolution equating anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. She voted presence. I called her office and told, told them that I thought that was just cowardly and that she no longer speaks for me. But I think we are, we still have a huge uphill battle. Um, the, the Zionists have managed to um, put every single college president on the defensive and it cost at least one person her job, which is, it was complete bullshit what they did 
in that hearing that they walked into a trap and they got trapped, slaughtered. So I think we have to resolve to continue the ideological and um, and uh, political struggle here and keep keep trying to build the movement that has had um, a fresh start since October 7th. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. I, I, I'm totally with you and I thank you for, for um, your particip participating in, in the battle. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> you're quite right, but we are making progress as, as, um, as Roger said, I, I've sort of been in this since 1965, um, which gives away my age, but uh, uh, the uh, I've seen a lot of changes and it's um, there's been a steady progression, especially in the last three decades. <laughs> and uh, and I honestly I think I think um, part of the motivation of Hamas's attack on on uh, October seventh was to move that along to 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 just give it a kick in the uh, kick in the rear and to get a higher level of discussion and debate about this and and to expose they they knew they absolutely knew that uh, that Israel was going to retaliate in this way but in this day and age with the um with the tools that are at our disposal, we have the means of knowing a great deal of what's going on, much of it instantly. Uh, and they knew that this was going to get through. I don't know what their ultimate plans are uh, uh, for the way it's going to go down, but I, I have my doubts that that Israel can, can outlast uh, Hamas. They are really prepared for, to, to, for a, a long, uh, battle and and they have allies that are ready to help them at uh, wh when it's come comes time to do that. So, uh, but it's carrying the discussion, the 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 hold that the international uh, Zionist organization has upon the power structure uh, and the media and the, uh, things that you're familiar with uh is is very strong and as you say to dislodge that coming from from passionate students who understand and and, and non-students who who understand uh and are learning more about what's uh, what uh, is going on it's 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 not going to happen overnight um but uh uh but i think we have to be patient. It's, it's, uh, we're making headway, and I think um, the headway will probably need to go on for quite some time before we succeed. But I think we will succeed, and the only, and the measure of success will be when uh, the reaction of the Israeli government in power, and this is probably a long way off, is the same as the reaction of. Um, uh, President de Klerk in South Africa, and say, "Okay, we're we're going to um, we're going to accept a, 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 a one nation uh, with equal rights." When that happens, then everything changes. But I, not much is going to change before then. I don't think. Okay, we're getting close to the end, and we have a number of people on the stack, so. Uh, let's try to be a little disciplined um, and see if we can get through the stack. But Wendy, you're, you're up now. Sure. Thank you so much. I'll be quick. Um, yeah, I really appreciate this discussion. And Paul, just your tremendous work and, you know, putting your life on the line um, around the issue of Palestinian freedom. And I just I wanted to just say um yesterday in a in a hands off a of Huru um, webinar, um, uh, which was entitled Anti-Semitism, I'll put the link in the chat, Anti-Semitism, a weapon of uh, the war against African and Palestinian liberation. That's a long title. But in that forum, um, Nancy Nancy Mansour of Existence is, uh, is Resistance, a Palestinian organization, said um, that in in Palestine, when people put something around the UN on the walls, um, it, they call it united nothing, right? They don't have any faith in 
in the UN. And um, but I did want to clarify just my um, I, I mentioned in the chat. Um, the fact that our organization doesn't support a ceasefire, we're calling because we're calling for an end to the Israeli settler colonialism and just understand that I'm as a white person, European person here, I'm part of the OG US settler colonialism that that needs to be overturned. And, and there's gonna, not going to be anyone on the ballot that's that's going to call for that as well. Um, but I just wanted to, um, yeah, appreciate this forum. There is an organization um, that's like a subcommittee of Uhuru Solidarity Movement called Jews Against Colonialism um, that I'm excited to to, to share. And also, um, Paul, just a quick thing. Um, you mentioned something about a payment um, platform that is Ben Friendly. Can you can you say what the name of that platform Absolutely. is? Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's IAT. It's a small I capital. ATS. They're based in Vancouver. They're Thank wonderful. You. They're uh, sometimes a little bit um, cumbersome to to deal with, but once they're in place, it's magic, and they they're um, very tolerant of of uh, uh, of they they're not they they don't listen to to uh, um, to imperialist and Zionist uh, pressure. They, they're awesome. impervious to it, as far as I can tell. Yeah. Okay, um, Jim, you're up next. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you, uh, Paul, that the uh, uh, Hamas was a, an amazing military operation, uh, attacking numerous bases uh, and uh, attacking soldiers. They did not go to kill civilians or rape them. They didn't have time to do that. That was a very quick moving operation. Uh, there were some people who came through the gate after them that may have done some things, but they were not, as you say, part of Hamas. Um, and uh, I'll point out to people in trying to dissuade them from thinking that uh, Hamas was responsible for that kind of stuff is that only the Israelis had equipment like gun gunships, helicopter gunships, that that uh, blasted those cars that were parked on the side of the road that the ravers were running towards uh, to the point where they were inoperable. Hamas was not carrying that kind of equipment, and um, and and now the Israelis are burying all those cars because they they're they're getting rid of the evidence. But there's plenty of video and pictures of it, and. Um, I'm wondering, though, I've been hearing a lot lately about uh, flooding the tunnels. I'm, I'm wondering if, if that, uh, and also the possibility of, as you brought up, the disease deal, uh, that, uh, that the flooding the tunnels with salt water uh, will make uh, Gaza unlivable, at least for a significant amount of time, and especially uh, uh, with the other things happening. And then the last thing, uh, I noticed that Whitney Webb uh, mentioned the connection to Epstein, and I've seen quite a bit of speculation about Epstein's power over some of the people in this country that ought to be more supportive of the Palestinians. Uh, could be because if it was a Mossad operation, that means that Netanyahu has all those videos, uh, of course, and we don't even know if Epstein was actually killed or not. Uh, but he was probably Mossad, and so was his girlfriend, and so was her father. So uh, uh, that's uh, that's something that uh, is going to be really hard to push back against because that's dirty shit. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, thank you, Jim. It's good to to hear from you, um, <clears throat> and uh, I think you're absolutely right. Um, as far as the conspiracy side of it and the extent to which Mossad and, and Israel uh, had control over events and did things for uh, and allowed things to happen like the in the Hamas uh, operation. Um, it's uh, first of all, I think maybe they underestimated what Hamas was capable of doing, but they wanted Hamas to do it um, in order to have a pretext for uh, uh, committing genocide and expelling or, or killing uh, 
uh, Palestinians. They just had enough. Of, they they wanted to. Uh, they didn't want this uh, anymore. They were and 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 uh, Netanyahu especially. Uh, if it had been somebody else in power, they might have said, "No, we got to nip this in the bud." But Netanyahu might have seen it as a means of enhancing his 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 power. Uh, if he could be the, the savior, if you like, the 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 one continuing the uh, the genocide that uh, resulted in the creation of Israel, and, and that he would be a hero after uh, for doing this, I don't know. He might have wanted it for his own purposes. There are all of these speculations that we we'll probably never find out about, uh, but. Uh, Yes, I think I. As far as I'm, I'm glad you're there to back me up on, on, on some of my facts. And we have to be very careful about uh, the news that reaches us. People, people uh, um, have to uh, wonder what what uh, putative facts are being shoved in our faces, and and the uh, and what we believe and what we don't believe. That's that's certainly one thing that uh, my long life has been been good for, and it, it is just increasing speculate uh, um, skepticism. Um, as I think next year, if I'm still around, I'll still I'll be even more skeptical than I am now. And okay, let, okay, let's try to move this on. Okay. Um, you know, <clears throat> minutes left, Paul. So, Bill, you, you're up next, and um, if you can unmute yourself and join us. Um, Said Bill, me. Yeah. No, I, he answered my question. He asked my question the previous person. So, thank you very much. Great, okay. great uh, discussion. Appreciate it. And, and Bill comes from the congressional district that has the most Palestinians in the United States. Um, Rich Johnson, you're next. Okay. Um, how about Yosef? Oh, no. Okay, Rich, you're, you're, you're up. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I didn't write down my question, of course. Now I oh, I remember it. Okay, I have a question. Uh, I can't remember her first name. I'm sorry. Flab, T-L-A-I-B. I think she's Minnesota or somewhere that. Uh, she's uh, appealing to funds. To get, they're talking about her and the rest of the squad are talking about a huge, huge uh, bankroll that somebody's putting up to uh, 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 try to defeat all of the, um, what we call the squad or people like them, the most progressive or claimed progressive. And uh, I just wondered uh, what you have to say about... Uh, uh, Ms. Talab, uh, Palestinian, I believe. Well, I, I know she is, she claims. Uh, so, and I, I personally, I like her. I can't say anything I don't like her. I know she's working in a cesspool, I mean, in Congress, excuse me. Uh, but I just wonder how you rate her, if you're aware of her, what you think about her politics in general, or particularly on this Palestinian question. Before you answer, Paul, I just want to say she's from my district in Detroit. Thank you, Rashida. <laughs> yes, I agree. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I we love Rashida. I think I, I heard from her before she was running, and uh, I know while when she was getting ready to run for Congress, and uh, she sounded a, a lot more tentative at, at that time. But I think especially after she got in Congress, she found her voice, and her uh, her district is very supportive of her. So, uh, and of course, I mean, she is of Palestinian origin and, and she's uh, so, well, you know, if uh, uh, um, I, I think it's impossible that for her to get elected as president, but I wouldn't mind. <laughs> okay, Yosef. Yes. Um, no, no, uh, I'm not. not, not oh, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> my apologies. Yeah, I, I have no, heard. It's my, my, um, my, my mistake. I apologize. <laughs> you said that. Uh, am I up? Yes, yes. please. Uh, okay. Well, one thing um, I think most uh, Palestinians agree that web to, to two state solution is not a solution, but I think they want it to be. Uh, uh, in the agenda 
because it basically gives them uh, for many few other reasons, but basically uh, it affirms that they exist uh, right now. Uh, second, um, I'll take a little you up on the uh, your uh, the social Darwinism that you exposed. Uh, there is also um, and and Richard Dawson also mentioned this that. Uh, ultimately, um, uh, Darwinian uh, uh, Darwinism is for survival of the species, not necessarily the individual. So people do have a, um, and all most animals do have a sense of uh, uh, altruism uh, uh, at times, so sacrifice for the good of the uh, all or the many. Uh, uh, second, uh, third. Uh, I studied uh, the portion of linguistics that um, uh, 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 Noam Chomsky somewhat, uh, 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 rather uh, somewhat, well, for good reasons, uh, somewhat disparaged, but uh, as boring. Uh, uh, but the 19th century uh, uh, view was not the uh, Hamitic, uh, Semitic, and Japhetic, rather it was uh, the uh, analytic, uh, the uh, agglutinative, and the isolating. And the uh, agglutinative they called Turanian, and uh, uh, so the analytic was supposed to be Ariana, I guess. And it, it was, but it, I think they were different categories. Japhetic was uh, coined by Mar. Uh, and I, I in, in a mistaken belief that um, uh, the Caucasian languages, which he thought were a unity, uh, were related to what we now call Afroasiatic. Uh, so uh, I don't think that was a, a, a racist. And we still continue using Cushitic. We have added Cushitic. We have done away with Hamitic, but we have added Cushitic, which is, again, another uh, a, a son of Noah just be, is a naming tradition. Uh, I don't think it's um, necessarily racist, though. Uh, so a Hamitic, as opposed to Semitic, might have some racial uh, prejudices behind it, um, uh, because we now divide it into Berber, uh, Egyptian, and so on. So uh, those are my comments, and if you have any thoughts. Okay. Yeah, I was okay. and Paul, if we're, we're just about out of time, so yeah. um, if you could please um, respond, but also um, take the opportunity to leave us with some final words, if you if you care to. Okay. Uh, well, <clears throat> I was saying that uh, uh, Semitic, Hamitic, and Japhetic originally were. Uh, considered starting in the Middle Ages as divisions of the of the world population, uh, and uh, they evolved into linguistic categories uh, in the 16th and 17th centuries. Uh, but you're quite right about the 19th century and and uh, the evolution. In fact, that started at the at the end of the 18th century. Um, with the discovery of the uh, relationship between the uh, Indo-European languages or the Proto-Indo-European languages. Um, and that's, that's when it really got off to a scientific footing. But, but the, the previous ca uh, categorization, uh, I, maybe it's just my opinion. My, my opinion is that it was based on, on perceived races. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's all I have to say about that. But as far as I, I just to, to sum up, I, I it's really an honor, <laughs> I have to say, to be to find so many people who I was hoping to find more people a lot more critical of me <laughs> than. But I, it's really wonderful to to find uh, uh, so many people who both understand and who. Uh, are hungry to to get more information, and I hope that the the information that I provided to you in the chat, for example, on on Telegram, if you aren't already on it, will will be helpful to you. Uh, and to, so it's it's really been a pleasure for me to to spend time with, with you, and I thank uh, everyone for this opportunity, and Roger especially. Yeah. 
Yeah, and and let me just echo what Paul just said. I, um, it, it's just an honor to be on these panels and to join everybody here. Going, on, I I can see with the gallery view just all the incredible um, organizers and activists and thinkers that come to the library this Sunday morning at the library. So, Paul, you've been an inspiration for us. I hope you continue being an inspiration for us. And next week, please join us. Thank you for coming. Good evening. Thank you, Thank you Paul. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Thank you.